Hey, welcome to Dan's Model Works. And this is part three of our 172nd scale Chinook build. This is the Matchbox kit. It was originally released in the 80s. And in part one and two, I basically detailed up the back of the ramp area here, mainly because I'm going to have the ramp open. And we can get a good shot here. Now basically the rest of the helicopter, the interior is completely devoid of detail. So my plan is I'm going to put a couple of scratch built skids with just some canvas covered loads on there just to block the fact that there's not really any fold up seat detail. My next step is going to be, oddly enough, masking off all of the windows here in the front. And the reason I'm going to do that right now is there's a lot of really small finicky details. We take a look at the instructions that have to go on here. And I figure if I figure if I glue all those on and then I go and I put the the, the masking tape on, I'll probably knock half of them off. Cuz it takes quite a bit of handling to do the cutting and all that sort of thing. So if I put the masking tape on now and then get the details glued on in one or two days then paint, we should be able to remove the masking tape without a problem. Just trying to think ahead. Now here's the front end once the masking tape has been applied. One advantage to the way Matchbox has engineered this kit is all of the side windows go in after you paint. So it's nice not to have to mask all those off. I would normally ignore the instructions and not put the landing gear on at this point. However, because there's a half a dozen antennas and hooks and rails that go on the underside of this, and I'd like to install them before painting, I am actually gluing the landing gear on. I'm not going to put the wheels on, however. I don't think this is going to cause any problems because after I paint everything all green it should be easy just simply to come at these with some silver paint and install the wheels at the end. But basically the landing gear legs, assuming I don't snap them off a couple times, will protect all the antennas and everything on the underside. As you can see here, I've cut the whole sprue portions that contain the rotor blades off all in one piece. I'm going to be uh, airbrushing these flat black and this will make it a lot easier to do and I can always come back later after I separate the blades and touch up these areas here. Now I was originally thinking I was going to be painting the ends of these rotor blades yellow but Chinooks don't seem to have that safety feature mainly it's probably maybe because the rotors are so high up but they don't have the yellow on the ends. These are just going to be a straight spray paint with flat black and then touch up the ends with some silver or whatever color the rotor head should be. Okay, I finished airbrushing the rotor blades here. As you can probably notice, there's masking tape over the parts of the rotor blades that are going on to the hubs. I did that just to make things a little easier. That way I can glue things together without having to worry about scraping off any paint and all those areas are probably going to be painted some sort of a metallic either a silver or gun metal or something like that so this was just going to make things a little easier for me. I would have shown gluing together the rotor heads but it took all four of my hands to hold them together to the glue set and I wouldn't have left anything to run the camera with. They were very fiddly and took a fair amount of effort to hold together till they glued together. I was assuming that this rotor head, rotor head detail here was going to be gun metal or steel color but upon looking at pictures it seems to be a semi-gloss black i've always assumed that most rotor heads were uh, natural metal so they can be inspected for cracks so i'm going to be giving this a coat of semi-gloss black after the glue for the landing gear had set i started adding the underside details and you can see given just how many protrusions there are why I was reluctant to do the masking on the nose after I glued these on. I'm still sure I'm probably going to break a bunch of these off. There is still one major hook to go on inside here 
and then there's a cover that was partly retracted. Um, I won't put that on until after I've painted everything else, mainly because I'm probably going to want to paint the inside of here. I don't know if it's supposed to be silver or some sort of zinc chromate color. But if the cover is on here and it's partially covering it, it'll be difficult to get in there to paint. I can always paint the cover separately and then add it later on. But with all the antennae that are under the nose, it almost looks like this is some sort of bottom feeding sea creature. So right now I'm gluing on the antenna stanchions that run along the upper fuselage. They're a little annoying because even though there's spots molded in for them, you basically have to drill the holes right through to get the stanchions to fit. And of course the other thing is, is they all have to be fairly parallel and heading in the same direction, otherwise it's going to look terrible. After it's been painted, I'll end up uh, using lycra to make the antenna going down the side. All of those antenna stanchions are now on. I've put the pitot tubes on the front, on the nose. Now, I was originally going to use the parts that came with the kit, but they really weren't cleaning up very well. And as well as that, it would have required really, really huge holes drilled in the nose to get them to go in. So I thought, why don't I just use some brass rod? And I think that looks a little bit cleaner. All right, hopefully we're ready for paint here. I've already broken a few things off. The pedo tube here at the front, knocked that off twice. Knocked this antenna off at least once. And just to make matters worse, if we turn this around this side here, Matchbox have you drill out holes for four grab irons, but they only give you two. So I had to fabricate some made out of brass. And of course, the brass is a lot smaller than the, the plastic grab irons. So I had to super glue them in place and then put some white glue in there to fill up the holes. We will see what this looks like after it gets painted. So I'm getting ready to paint the Chinook here. And I'm always looking for ways that I can hold a model without having to handle it too much while it's being painted. And in this case, what I've done is I've basically found a screwdriver that the handle will fit up inside the helicopter. And then I'm holding it using the largest set of vice grips I've got. And then that way, I can basically spray all of the surfaces and I can reposition without having to touch the model. Here I've just applied the Tamiya gloss coat on top of the olive drab. The gloss coat is dry, so it's time to start putting the decals on. Hopefully I won't end up with any serious silvering problems like I did on the Wildcat. Looks promising so far. I don't see any silvering or anything like that. You can see a little bit of the edge at the top of the decal, so I think maybe thickness of decals may be an issue. One thing I did have to do was there was a little bit of bluish residue in and around the decal when I pulled it off, so that had to be wiped away. And otherwise, it looks like they, they're going to go on without any silvering. One thing that's a little annoying about this decal sheet is there's no numbers on any of these decals. You're basically stuck looking at the instructions and saying, well, that looks like it could be that warning symbol there. Certainly makes it a little more difficult. Mind you, um, unless you happen to buy this particular release, you won't have this problem. If this kit ever gets re-released, it'll be by Revell, and they'll probably do a new decal sheet for it. Okay, the decal setting solution has had a chance to work on that number on the rear pylon. You can still see a little bit of the top edge of the decal, but it certainly is bedding down a lot better than it was. One interesting thing about these decals is normally the last thing you want is for the decal to come free of the paper before you're ready to push or position it. On this one, however, you almost want the decal to come free so you can swish it around in the water to get rid of that blue residue from the decal sheet. But that might have something to do with the age of the paper that it's on. Here's an example of the bluish fluff I was talking about. The decals have all been applied and the setting solution on them. So now I can finally get around to putting the, uh, the dull coat lacquer on. All right, I've painted all of the framing around the porthole windows, and hopefully when we pop them in place, they'll look fine. 
And as I've already mentioned before, the uh, clarity of this plastic is not brilliant. Very, very milky looking. So I'm not expecting anyone to look in these windows and see any detail or lack of detail. The dull coat is dry, so now we can finally get those masking tape off of the cockpit windows. Well, we have mostly success. A little bit of bleed through on this panel for some reason or other, and some up there. So I'm going to have to see if I can get that cleaned off. Okay, I used a Q-tip with just a tiny bit of paint thinner on it to wipe down those windows, and I got most of the paint off. All right, we're well into final assembly. I've started putting the windows in place here, and fortunately they fit pretty good. I have to hold off on putting the main gear legs on here, mainly because I've snapped this sucker off a couple times and I'm waiting for the glue to dry. Hopefully that leg will eventually be able to take the weight. The main cargo hook has been glued in place. The tread of the tires is unpainted, even though the fronts and back are painted. The main reason for that was there was a fairly significant seam on it. So my plan was is to paint most of the wheel on the sprue, then separate it, sand it down, and once they're glued on to the aircraft, then I'll simply touch up the the black paint or the tire gray on the tread. I still have to run the antenna down the side, but otherwise it is coming together. You can tell it's final assembly because I'm breaking parts off as fast as I'm putting them on. I've just broken off the other pitot tube right here. While gluing it on it went kapring and it landed somewhere in George the part eating carpet. I have to make a new one and while we're on the subject of things that go wrong, we're talking five windows on each side and two kinds of windows. So of course I managed to screw it up. So if you look on here we have search and rescue window, three regular windows, search and rescue window. Wasn't until the super glue went off that I noticed that it should be search and rescue window, two regular windows, search and rescue window, regular window. So one side's correct, this side the other side's not quite correct. I don't think it's worth changing. All right, all the wheels are on. And I haven't knocked off any of the landing gear again. If we move to the front, you can see there's the pitot tube that got replaced. All the windows are in place. We're getting there. I think it's time for me to head off to bed and let some glue dry. So I'm on the home stretch, and of course things aren't going well. My next step was supposed to be stringing the antenna from the stanchions on the side of the fuselage here. My plan was to use one of my favorite materials, Lycra, which is nice because it stretches. This roll may be getting a little old because two or three times while uh, tying it on, it snapped, although I can't seem to get it to snap now. So I do have a couple backups. I can do uh, stretch sprue or I'm going to try using something that the camera won't pick up. There we are. I wish I could tell you the size of this brass rod, but I've lost the, the header card from the package that it came out of. So this will be the next attempt, is I'll try using this fine wire, which I'm looking at the camera and I can see it is finally picking it up. As well, another setback is my uh, tester's... Uh, Jet exhaust color. My bottle of paint has just about had it. I've thinned it probably about a dozen times. So this is after two coats. Hopefully the jet exhausts from the turbo shafts will look better after a third coat. Well, the very fine brass rod idea ended up not working. So I went back to the Lycra. It mostly worked all right, except for this bit right here. So I'm going to cut that out and redo it because it shouldn't be all kind of crinkly like that. And it's done. Well, as done as everything I ever build ever gets to be called done. I'm sure there are some things that I really could go back and add. The kit comes with separate windshield wipers, but they really didn't seem to go on very well, so I left them off.
Of course, here's the side view with the antenna strung on it. And you can see all those antennas that hang down the bottom. Here's a view of the back end showing the detail added to the ramp entrance. And you can see the other side. And that little piece inside the ramp is actually the upper part of the ramp. It telescopes out when it gets closed fully. There we can see the roof. Of the ramp area. I think it was worth uh, putting the detail on the inside of the ramp. Here's the non-antenna side. And you can see the pedo tubes on the nose. Certainly a lot nicer looking than the parts that Matchbox gives you. Overall, I'm happy with the way the kit went together. There were a few stumbles, but overall I'm happy with it. So my Chinook is now ready to join the other members of the Piasecki Vertol Boeing helicopter family in my collection. So here we have the Labrador, which is the Canadian search and rescue variant of the Sea Knight. We have the H-21. And then the H-U-P Retriever. You can certainly see how the basic design has grown in size and capability over the years. So thanks for watching Dan's Model Works. And until next time, just keep modeling.